When I first saw that I was doing this movie, I got a reaction that I didn't really expect. A lot of people say that they really like this movie. And while that's fine, opinions are opinions, it made me kind of curious. This movie, the movie that most people seem to think is the worst DreamWorks film ever, has more people who say they liked it than, say, Cars 2. Then I looked into it. Shark Tale is one of the most successful bad movies of all time. It was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, but I don't put much stock in that. Back then, every animated feature was nominated for an Academy Award. Well, that's not entirely true. This movie was nominated over both the Spongebob movie and the Polar Express. Yeah, I, I don't take the Academy Awards very seriously. This movie is based on a toy. It can't possibly be good. This movie is based on a video game. It can't possibly be better than this film, which strings together a bunch of Disney cliches into a very cliched story. It'll be decades before an animated film wins Best Picture, and it's going to be a film like Waltz with Bashir when it happens. But never mind accolades, what's more surprising is Shark Tale's profits. For what's known as the low point of DreamWorks, it was massively successful. It was even number one in the United States theaters for three weeks. It was the ninth most profitable movie of 2004. And 2004 was not a bad year in film. It wasn't even a bad year for animated films, really. Not the best, but still decent. Then I took a look at it, and it all made sense. This movie is a lot worse now than it was when it first came out. You might have heard of this little trick. Doing everything possible to be hip and relevant, and trying to cash in on current trends. This is essentially what every Seltzer and Friedberg movie does ever. Every fact about this movie just seems like a corporate cash-in. Not only did they make sure to put in whatever celebrities were popular at the time, but they made sure to make the characters look like them by creating these unholy monstrosities. And I'll be getting into that in just a bit. Everything from the way that they talk to the suspicious fact that another animated film starring Fish was released a massive success just the year before. And as such, this movie has aged. It's aged about as well as a bag of rotten eggs on a summertime sidewalk. I didn't like this film growing up, and watching it again, it is the most dated, pandering thing that DreamWorks has ever made. And let's start with what you've probably already noticed. The animation. This is one of the ugliest animated features that I've ever seen. Mainstream animated features. It's not because the technology was bad or anything. From a technical perspective, there's no rendering issues. The characters move like they should. But this movie massively fails in terms of aesthetics. Something largely independent of technology. The characters that we'll be looking at for the next hour and a half find themselves squarely in the Uncanny Valley. I said that Marzine's mom's characters looked like they were halfway through evolution. It's the same thing here. The only difference is that this time it was intentional. As such, it looks worse than movies that technically have worse animation, like Norm of the North. But beyond that, there's the color palette. If you go back and watch Finding Nemo, you'll see that the color choices were amazing. They really pop, and they massively vary throughout the movie, making Under the Ocean seem very appealing. This movie decides to go with the greasy, grimy, algae look, making anything that's not ugly, horribly boring to look at. The world of Shark Tale through a pure aesthetic level does not look like a fun place to be, which in itself could easily kill an animated film. The ability to create whatever palette you want is one of animation's strongest tools, and when it's done properly, Properly, we get movies like Fantasia and Inside Out. When it's done improperly, we get Shark Tale. But you know what? DreamWorks is best at taking ideas that look stupid and going above and beyond with them. If anything, their company stands for not judging books by their covers. I thought that How to Train Your Dragon and Kung Fu Panda were going to be stupid and pandering going in. But they turned out to be some of the greatest not only movies in animation history, but some of the greatest series in animation history. So maybe we just have to look beyond the pale for this one. We start with the DreamWorks logo, casting Worm into the Ocean, who soon finds himself surrounded by a shark. Hi, I'm Lenny. Hi, Lenny! I look forward to hating you throughout the rest of this movie because I hate pretty much all of the characters in this movie. Because they each find themselves portraying some of the purest forms of the character stereotypes that I hate. Also, this is just a minor nitpick, but I really hate Lenny's voice. You know the thing that Adam Sandler does where he makes his voice have a weird pitch to disguise it that makes it sound god-awful, despite him being in the movie supposedly being a selling point? Get a hold of yourself, man! This is no time to act crazy! Yeah, well, it's no less painful when Jack Black does it. Lenny is a shark who is a vegetarian, and he's an outcast because his refusal to eat animals. Considering the last movie that I reviewed, we're off to an amazing start. Rule of thumb, if you have a meat-eating animal that doesn't eat meat, your movie is probably going to bomb. It's just a little trend that I've noticed. Hey, you wanna play a game? 
It's called Count the Product Placements. Literally two and a half minutes into the movie and we get this screenshot. And then we get introduced into the movie's world. Okay, we're gonna talk about the first major problem with this movie. I know I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but it's a big problem that's gonna continuously come back throughout the entire movie. While watching this movie, I was constantly asking myself, why was this movie set underwater? Okay, I know why, but what story purposes did it serve? What did they really do with the world? Besides these stupid fucking puns. Good morning, Southside Reef. I'm Katie Current. Muscle Crow! You get absolutely nothing. I mean, in these establishing shots, they try to give some jokes that don't really work, and they seem very lazy. And then we get nothing with the world being underwater. In Finding Nemo, the setting was integral to the story. In Harry Potter, the setting was integral to the story. If you're going to set a story in some place that isn't the real world, or our familiar world, the setting has to be integral. If not, you end up wasting time on establishing things that aren't important, and possibly confusing the audience. If you set Shark Tale in New York, literally nothing about the story would change. It would star Oscar, who works at a car wash, and accidentally kills a member of the mob, gets famous and held as a hero for that, and so the mob wants revenge. It's the same exact story. And if that sounds like a generic gangster movie, you'd be correct. Shark Tale is the most generic gangster movie in history, and they tried to hide that by setting it underwater. But that trick doesn't really work when they keep trying to make everything seem closer to a generic city than the ocean. So let's see how this generic movie introduces its generic main character. Hi, I'm Oscar. You might think you know, but you have no idea. Let's see here, you're a down on his luck loser who wants to be a big shot, even though it requires a big personality to be famous and you have no personality. Yep. You so broke, yo baloney had no first name. I thought I got this movie in English. I have no idea what he meant by that. So apparently this is referencing an old Oscar Mayer baloney commercial. Although it doesn't really make any sense due to the way it's written. Oh my god, Oscar is so poor he buys the generic brand of baloney. Wait a minute, they're fish! They don't eat baloney! So after introducing some characters who don't do anything in the story and telling us next to nothing about Oscar, except that he doesn't like to work, he heads off to work. This is the car wash. I mean the car wash. I mean the attempt to hide the fact that it's a car wash. Where he finds out that he was punched in by his friend Angie. She has a crush on Oscar. And we'll be getting to this, but it's going to be one of the most annoying aspects of the movie. I know I keep saying that, but there are a lot of annoying aspects to this movie. We immediately see that Oscar is obnoxious and annoying, which is obnoxiously annoying. Maybe the screenwriters knew that, because with Angie, they went to the other extreme. How do I want to describe her character? Someone could be turning her into sushi, and she wouldn't say a thing. She'd stay absolutely silent. And she'd glare at the people she wanted to rescue her through walls or something, and get angry when they didn't have psychic powers. And when that plan fell through, as a ghost, she'd get angry at the person who didn't know she was in trouble and failed to help her, because they didn't know she was in trouble. She's that kind of character. Oh, you don't mean that. Well, of course I do. You're like my best friend. Now that's exposition. I'd say show, don't tell, but I think for once I can actually forgive that. Because if Oscar didn't flat out say that these two are best friends, there would be absolutely no way that the audience would think that he finds Angie as his friend. I'm not kidding. L l listen, tell, tell me what you think about this. This is like the best idea ever. You'll stop making those facial expressions? We're not even 10 minutes into this movie and I already want to puke. Oscar is probably the worst designed character in motion that I have ever seen in an animated movie. Movie. Yes, this includes Dorby's and Mars Needs Moms. And Oscar goes to do his job, but not before giving Angie another product placement. And then he reminds Angie that she's still on hold. The hold that he put her on just so he can get out of work, which he was late for already. Guy's wonderful, isn't he? Then we see the sharks, where he's intimidating the boss of the imitation car wash. Now you and me, we worked together a long, long, long time. <laughs> Please. That I've lived my life for my sons, raising them and protecting them. I'm also 42 years old. My blood type is AB negative. I ate tuna for breakfast, and the writers don't know jack shit about exposition. Hey, boss. Big butts. <laughs> you know, that, that joke might have worked, except that literally no character in this movie has a butt. But as you can see, this movie is a godfather wannabe, which confuses me on every level. You see Finding Nemo and you think, Godfather, what's the next brilliant fusion? You know what? I would totally watch the shit out of that. So the head shark wants his two sons to run the mob. I mean the reef, I think. What? What what? 
What, what, nothing. You said what first. I didn't say what first. I asked you what. No, you said and then what, and I said what. This is dialogue, ladies and gentlemen. Why did this movie make $360 million again? Of course, one of the sharks isn't the person that the father wants him to be. He's an embarrassment because blah, blah, blah. It's another plot that you've seen before. Time and again. And it's going to end exactly the way you expect it to. Because the pufferfish points this out, the shark mob leader goes crazy and fires him and says that he has to start paying to prevent the whale wash from breaking down. Ah, uh, stop your moaning, Oscar. It could be a lot worse, you know? Yeah, that's true. I could have this job and look like you. You know, I don't think he said one positive thing about another person fish in this entire movie so far. Some jellyfish come and attack Oscar and bring him into the boss's office. Then this happens. See, baby? Uh, show me that. Uh, so, uh, what's going down? Hey, baby, just. Oh, oh hey, don't sweat it, Sykes. A lot of white fish can't do it. Okay, what the fuck? I'd count all the reasons that this joke doesn't work, but we don't have all day. I want to keep this review shorter than the movie. They told a race joke in a movie about Technicolor fish, where no two fish have the same color. Oscar isn't black. He's blue, green, and yellow. If you wanted me to see Will Smith there, you should have made this movie in New York City and made it live action. The puffer fish is yellow, purple, and brown, not white. The joke doesn't make sense on any level. In the time since I've uploaded the first part of this review, a lot of people have told me that whitefish is actually a term for a certain type of fish. I think that that might have been an accident and that's not what the writers were going for, because if they are, then the joke makes even less sense, because a pufferfish is not a type of whitefish. Also, the pufferfish boss keeps inflating because I have not seen that before. It's not like another movie taking place under the ocean came out this exact same year. So Oscar has 24 hours to pay 5,000 clams. So this character, he's lazy, he's inconsiderate, he's an asshole, he's a wannabe, he doesn't pay money back that he borrows. Why the hell is he the protagonist of this movie again? I'm a little fish in a big pond. A really big pond. I'm a nobody. I want some of that. The top of the reef, where the somebody's live. I want to be rich and, and famous like them, but... You know, of all the things that are dated in this movie, it's not the humor or the characters or the animation that's aged the most. It's probably the plot. After watching BoJack Horseman, I can never watch one of these I want to be famous pity party plots the same way ever again. Because what people in this movie don't seem to realize is that being famous is not an end goal. People who become famous don't try to get famous. They do things like write, or make movies, or make people laugh, and they connect with a massive audience. I mean, if you're famous for just being famous, then you're probably the joke of all of society. Fame and being a somebody is just something that comes with it. And if you think you can get famous by doing absolutely nothing, you're an idiot on multiple levels. I mean, people who are famous for being famous, they aren't exactly very successful people. They're the jokes of society. They end up in tabloids all the time. After this movie came out, we've been getting more and more stories of people who've had their stars burn out. They've lost relevance. Their lives have been turned to hell. They've had to turn to drugs or this or that destructive behavior. We learned that Oscar's dad was also working at the whale wash for 25 years, and then he died. And Oscar wants more than that. And in order to get that, he has a very successful plan. He doesn't go looking for new jobs. He doesn't take chances. He doesn't try to learn new skills. His plan is perfect. He waits for fame to be handed down to him. In the meantime, he blows other people's money on get-rich-quick schemes. So yes, this movie stars that guy who lives on your couch and who won't leave no matter what you do. And she cares about Oscar. I don't know why, but... I want, I want to be a somebody. Oscar, you don't have to live at the top of the reef to be a somebody. And to help pay off his debts, she gives him her grandmother's heirloom, a pink pearl. It'll get the money that he needs for Mr. Sykes. And guess what our hero does? The protagonist that we're supposed to root for and want to see succeed. He bets the money on a horse race. Excuse me while I bang my head against the wall. So Oscar has the perfect opportunity to be safe and comfortable and a chance to start over. And he blows it because he heard two random people who might be crazy talking about how the race is rigged. And he has absolutely no way to verify the story and he just decides to go with it. If you think that this is bad though, you should have seen what he did last week when he answered that email from the Prince of Nigeria. 
He is doing this with the money given to him through someone who he said in his own words was his best friend. This money came from an heirloom from this person's grandmother who is presumably dead. Oscar is the most stupid and selfish character I've ever seen in an animated movie. He's more stupid than Norm and he's more selfish than Buck Cluck. I don't hate him as much as Buck Cluck because his idiocy usually only hurts himself instead of others, but it's a damned feat. Especially since this is his first scene after we get his backstory that's supposed to make us feel sorry for the guy. So, when it's said that this horse has the chance to pay out a million clams, he gets the attention of Lola. You'll notice that the animators tried their damnedest to make a fish sexually attractive. Be right back, go into the bathroom. Now I want you to listen to the soundtrack here. Not too long because of copyright, but just listen to the soundtrack. Wow. There's bad exposition. There's tell don't show. But they're literally telling us her character without showing any trace of it through songs that the people behind the movie didn't even write themselves. While looking at the most uncanny facial expressions that you can make an animated creature have. If that's what love makes people look like, then the species would be extinct eons ago. <laughs> you got a name? <laughs> you want to tell me what it is? <laughs> see, you don't see how common it is until someone points it out. But as soon as someone does, you see it everywhere. Why does this love-struck blubbering annoy me? Because even shallow, lustful attraction is deeper than being tongue-tied. Because from a storytelling perspective, dialogue is a limited resource, and this is the equivalent of driving a coal-powered Hummer. Because it's annoying, because it makes me feel stupid for hearing it, because it drags the story to a screeching halt, because in a visual medium it tells us no information, except that the other character is attracted to them. Which you could do with less distracting visual cues, because this has been overdone since the 80s. Shall I go on? Look, deep down, I'm really superficial. Yeah, the dialogue in this movie is excessively bad. Like, this might be some of the worst dialogue that I've ever seen in an animated movie. Just pointing out the stereotypes a parody or satire does not make. It's almost like they mix up the character biographies and the plot synopses and just used that as the final draft. Also, notice how all the fish characters are standing up and framed like humans would be, even though the characters aren't really given an anthropomorphic design like in Spongebob. It's almost like this movie shouldn't have been set underwater. I know I keep bringing that up, but I'm saying this specifically now, because Oscar's horse trips and loses the race. Underwater. And they bring this up. And he trips underwater. Who in the hell of it trips underwater? Indeed, it's almost like this movie should have been set in an above-sea movie starring humans! But it wasn't because he wanted to cash in on the success of much better movies. And yes, Spongebob makes jokes like this, too. But when they do that, it doesn't really affect the plot. So, Mr. Sykes has his jellyfish goons kidnap Oscar to kill him at a very crowded horse race where witnesses could easily see and hear him. Also, yes, this is another mob movie cliché. So, the two sharks go out to prove that Lenny is a real shark, and they come across Oscar. This goes about as well as expected. Lenny clearly explains the plan, and then this happens. Look, I'm just pretending so you can get away. Huh? Now, when I turn around, you take off! Mmm! Oh, no. no. What did I tell oh, you? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. You want me to go now? What are you... Oscar isn't going to do one remotely intelligent thing in this entire movie, is he? I'm sorry, but this character is just too stupid! I get the point if this movie was supposed to be something like Beavis and Butthead or Wayne's World, but it's not! This character is supposed to be at least aware of his reality. His stupidity isn't the point. And that makes Oscar's endeavors very hard to watch. This leads to the other shark, Frankie, getting killed by an anchor which Lenny immediately destroys, and he leaves, leading the jellyfish to think that Oscar killed the shark. Seeing this as an opportunity to get famous quickly, Oscar takes credit. You know how a lot of people hate the liar revealed trope? Not entirely sure, but I think this movie is going to follow that plot to a T, not taking a single deviation from it. So like a jerk, Oscar pushes aside Angie, and then he gets noticed by Lola. Sykes then places himself as Oscar's manager, despite almost killing Oscar and not really being able to contribute much of anything. Yes, he's the manager of a car wash, but that's incredibly different than managing a person, especially a walking disaster area that Sykes knows Oscar to be. They partner up, and neither of them are happy about it. So nothing about this makes any sense. Okay. Well, Oscar is happy about the death, the shark's family certainly isn't. We learn that Lenny hasn't been found yet, yet they somehow found the body of Frankie that only Lenny knew the location of. 
Then a shark says that he knows who killed Frankie. Then we get a fart joke, and he reveals where Oscar is, somehow. No sharks live in the reef, and the only person we know has connections would have no reason to inform them of anything anymore. In fact, it's revealed that the only person with connections to the sharks reveals Oscar's location later. It's time for a boring fame montage. Seriously, why the fuck does Oscar look so hideous? Anime movies take, like, a year to make. At one point, you should have looked at this and realized that it was fucking disgusting. The sharks looked fine. Oh, wait. Maybe that's because, in that case, they wanted the fish to look like fucking fish. So Angie goes to Oscar's housewarming party, and this is the part of the movie that she gets annoying. I am attracted to you. That was five words. Eight syllables. They took me a total of six seconds to say. Guess what Angie never says throughout the film until it's too late? Not only that, but when she comes close to saying that, she hides it. I know it's not as common for the girl in the situation to make the first move, even less so ten years ago but it's especially painful in this movie. She expects Oscar to read her mind, make him make the first move when she does everything possible to hide her interest. And on some level, she knows that she's going to be waiting on Oscar to read her mind for a very long time, because she knows that Oscar has trouble reading his own mind. But here's an even bigger question to why this romance confuses me. Why is she attracted to Oscar at all? Being the protagonist of the movie doesn't count. He gives her back her heartfelt gift, which to anyone who's not a massive idiot is a slap in the face. And he didn't even tell her that he tried to gamble it away. Seriously, what does she see in him? Or is she just into his hot body? Huh? My grandmother's pearl. <laughs> With interest. Now, I don't forget anything, and I never forget who my friends are. And apparently she's been friend-zoned, too. Now she's going to spend the rest of the movie being incredibly bitter and angry when Oscar goes for someone else, despite the fact that they're not together and they never have been. It's amazing. I know, it's beautiful, right? Like you. Like you, your new apartment. It's... wow! Seems the Shark Slayer not only conquered a few sharks today, but maybe <gasps> a few hearts have been snapped up. I'm Katie Current. Here live. What? Everyone in this movie is an idiot. Five words, screenwriters. Five words. And then comes Lola. You know, when getting into a relationship, there are some things that come off as red flags, and they tell you of a person that you should probably try to avoid. And one of them is your partner being shallow. You know, like Oscar is. But Lola here outright admitted that she was shallow. You know, there is many reasons why show don't tell is a rule. Because when you tell something like, this person is shallow, it makes Oscar look like a fucking idiot! Of course, the scene can't go anywhere because there are some sharks swimming through the reef. And because Oscar is now the shark slayer, it's his job to take them out. Tells you, you don't get to be famous for doing nothing. Outside, Oscar meets Lenny. He could be anywhere. <gasps> Ooh! Shh! The shark slayer. Everyone in this movie is an idiot. He was there when his brother got killed. The shark that everyone was claiming to be killed by the shark slayer. He should be the first to know that there is no shark slayer. Am I going mad? And because Lenny doesn't want to go home, he wants to live with Oscar. Are you crazy? Please. No, he's an idiot. If he was crazy, then his behavior would make sense. Wait, you mean you? Yeah. When the anchor... <gasps> So you're afraid of the shark slayer even though you know that the shark claiming to be killed was killed by the anchor and not the shark slayer. Yep, 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 yep. No, 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 no. Go back and rewrite the fucking script. And because this is a by the numbers liar revealed story, Lenny takes advantage of the liar and manipulates him with the lie. Oscar, for some reason, goes along with this. Let me describe what exactly is going on. No fish would listen to a rogue shark. Lenny isn't going to hurt anyone. He's a vegetarian. And Lenny just said that he was an outcast and he couldn't go home to Oscar's face. Yeah, everyone, everyone's a moron. Moron party, let's go! Am I watching Shark Tale or Idiocracy? Lenny tells Oscar that he's a vegetarian, and then we get the stereotypical I said I'm not going to laugh, but I'm gonna laugh joke. And then Oscar learns that Lenny's father is the Godfather. The movie's words, not mine. Chief Pop knew that, he'd ice you for sure. <laughs> Was he the Godfather or something? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean, yeah? Yeah, he is. You know, it's pretty tacky to point out what you're plagiarizing by name. And Sykes is on the phone with the shark. And he keeps making all kinds of big promises in Oscar's name. Seriously, like, I am legitimately curious. To Why did Oscar let this guy be his manager? I've watched this movie plenty of times. 
Like I said, I grew up with it. But I could never figure out why Oscar let Sykes be his manager. Oscar never really liked working for Sykes. Sykes is a bad manager, not only because he's making deals with the mob, but he's also giving money to someone who never pays up. He gets Oscar into trouble, and oh yeah, he tried to have Oscar killed by his two jellyfish goons. And now, because of Sykes, the sharks are going to kill Oscar. If I didn't know any better, I think this was all just one convoluted revenge plot on Sykes' behalf. And he knew exactly what he just did. So Sykes leaves and- you don't want to do that. I don't? You have worked your way to the top. You don't want to go back to the bottom. I'd be ranting at how they tried to make her abuse seem comical, but all I can really see is despite staring Oscar in the face, she's not actually looking at him and her eyes are going off in random directions. So when Oscar goes to check up on Lenny, he finds out that Angie knows about him. So the only reason that Oscar is keeping him is so that he can keep Oscar's secret, which he just failed to do. Yet the only reason he was able to tell Oscar's secret is because Oscar kept him. Excuse me for a moment. What were you thinking? You know what? I think that we need some visual representation to show what was going through Oscar's head at any point in this movie. Remember what Angie said. Remember what Angie said. Thousand unlucky day to win. With how long you've been friends and attracted to him, I thought that you most of all would know how utterly fucking stupid that he is. How could you lie to me, no. Oscar? Me! Don't take it personally. Come on, I lied to everybody. Yes. Like I said, there's plenty of reasons that there's this rule, show don't tell. It's not something we tell writers just because we want to be mean. It's because when you do something like tell us that say these two are friends, then it makes it really hard to buy when we're shown nothing but contradictory information. Sharks are coming to get me! And they should! You realize that that means they're gonna try to eat you too, right dumbass? They're gonna eat the whole fucking reef. So Lenny and Oscar come up with a plan. Point taken. What's the plan? Or they try to before Angie interrupts them. You tell the truth, and you go home. <laughs> you know what? I see Oscar and Lenny's point. In fact, this is the smartest thing that they say in the entire movie. I'm serious. The only thing that's meant to be wrong and that goes against the plot is the most correct and right thing that they've said. Yes, in this movie where the lesson is that it's good to tell the truth, they made telling the truth the worst possible thing that they could do. You know how everyone loves Oscar and has made him really famous right now? And he's spending a lot of money given to him because of this? And he's doing all of these brand sponsorships and deals, if Oscar told the truth right now, he'd go to jail for fraud, and he'd be sued and lose everything he had, everything Angie had, everything his children had, everything his grandchildren have, for about a hundred generations. Continuing the lie right now is the only logical option. Or is Angie in on Mr. Sykes' revenge plan too? Then again, their way of going about this yeah. is... I'm gonna be as stupid as Oscar by the time this movie is over, I swear. Here's the plan. Oscar is gonna fake Lenny's murder. The Godfather Shark is mad at you because you killed one of his sons. The perfect way to stop this is to kill the other one of his sons and make him even more pissed at you with even more blind rage. Everyone's a moron. Everyone's a tool with this harebrained scheme. Everyone's a moron. Everyone's a moron. You can't handle the truth. You had me at hello. And it makes me want to scream. And because logic is dead, the Shark Mafia sees Lenny's fake death, and despite them having more numbers and knowing that Lenny isn't exactly the sharkiest shark out there, that intimidates them enough to run away. Seems the Shark Slayer not only conquered a few sharks today, but maybe... <gasps> I'm sorry, but if you haven't said anything, especially with the intelligence of someone of a brick wall who needs you to talk very slowly and spell it out, I can't feel sorry for you or like Oscar did something indignant. Especially because she was the one who kissed him. He didn't kiss her, she kissed him. Edge, Edge, what is the problem? Problem, there's no problem. I don't have any problem. You know, I, I don't think you two are really communicating, and I'm no psychologist, but I think that's putting a severe hamper on your relationship. Just saying, you might want to be more clear with Oscar. Use your words! Just tell me, Oscar, because I'm curious. 
Why do you think she's interested, huh? Considering that she flat out said that she was shallow to Oscar, I think that he knows. And because Oscar is into her, that means that Oscar is pretty shallow too. Which, once again, makes me wonder, why the hell are you attracted to him? Do you think No. This is who Oscar has always been, and the lies and stuff just unmasked it. When the lies go away, this is who Oscar will be. Oscar and Angie are people who value vastly different things. And you know, it makes me feel like these just aren't the right people for each other. Oscar belongs with Lola because they're just as incredibly shallow as each other. This is how badly they screwed up the romance in this movie. Or rather, how badly they screwed up with Oscar, because most of the problems in this movie come down to Oscar. I seriously don't know what Angie sees in Oscar. He's stupid. He's shallow. He doesn't get her signs. He's never there for her. He doesn't listen to her. He betrays her. He doesn't care about her gifts. Yeah, there's accepting someone for their flaws, but then there are also these people with no redeeming value. Honestly, I don't want these two to get together for Angie's sake, never mind Oscar's. Like I said, without the money and without the lies and without the fame, Oscar's still gonna be the same stupid and selfish, awful person that he is now. So, Oscar takes a walk through Skid Row before he sees that someone is in his penthouse suite, and a party has started without him. Are there no trespassing laws in this world? And we see Lola trying to talk Oscar out of his funk. I don't really know what's going on here. And Oscar realizes that he's in love with the girl that told him that all of his dreams are stupid and he should just forget them and that all he needs is her. What's the matter, Angie? I thought you wanted people to read deeply into your intentions even though you didn't want to say them. But honestly, looking back, uh, that's what all of her dialogue sounds like. You don't need to be big and famous. All you need is the people who love you. All you need is me. And she communicates this through mind games, waiting for an idiot to fall in on her signs, when she should know him well enough to know that he's too stupid to do that. So Oscar tries to break up with Lola. Please tell me that that joke is as dated as the rest of the movie and no one finds that funny either. Then the next day, he finds out that the mob kidnapped Angie, the girl that he only decided was his girlfriend with himself the previous night, who was pretty much invisible to him every other time. Then Sykes learns that Oscar is a fake, and they go to a sit-down where everyone is afraid of him. Then the shark godfather comes in, showing that they've got Angie. So apparently it was Lola who went to the sharks, without, you know, getting eaten. Why does this movie take place underwater in starfish again? It does literally nothing but hurt the movie. And then Oscar tries to bluff them out by having Lenny eat Angie. And because eating fish, a meat-based product, makes the meat-eating shark throw up, you know where this is gonna go. So Oscar keeps going on and on, bragging and gloating because he's an idiot. And this reveals that it's Lenny. Whoa! 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 Hey boss, it's Lenny! He was wearing a disguise so we wouldn't recognize him, but now he's not wearing a disguise. You know, they're telling us what we just saw. It's not a joke, right? Stating what's going on in screen. It's not a joke. If that was the case, my videos would be hilarious, wouldn't they? Or did you think that if, for one second, you actually showed something instead of outright told the audience, they'd be too stupid to figure out what was going on? At this point, I could believe either. Listen, it, it's not his fault. Th this is between you and me. What did I ever do to you? Um, you probably ate a ton of his friends, family, and neighbors. Your crime net ran his town and his place of work. And when Oscar couldn't pay the debt that you set forward, someone tried to kill him. That's just a short list of what you did to him. And now we get into a climax. Thankfully, that means we're almost done. Oscar lures the shark godfather to the whale wash and gets him trapped. Or not. Lenny? What are you doing in there? Sorry. It's funny, he's stupid. Then Oscar traps the shark godfather. So then the crowd comes to hail Oscar as a hero. Now that he has finally actually managed to beat a shark, he's going to say that he can't fight shark. Stop! I am not a real shark slayer! Uh, yeah, Phoenix Reich. I've got some new work for you. It's quite lucrative. You see, there's this idiot who took up a bunch of brand deals claiming that he was this shark slayer. And that was the pretense that they hired him to advertise their brands. Of course, if he kept lying, I wouldn't need to call you, but he told the truth, and now every single product placement in history wants a piece of his ass. So this client is gonna keep you in work until you're 200 years old. Seriously, in this movie where the moral is that the truth will set you free, has set up a moment where telling the truth will probably land Oscar in jail for a good long time. 
And don't say that this is just a kid's movie and I'm thinking too deeply about it. If this story wasn't animated fish, it'd probably be rated PG-13. This is a story that's point for point a ripoff of The Godfather, which is not a kid's movie, with on-screen deaths, someone brutally getting hit in the head with an anchor, complicated relationships between stupid people. Oh yeah, and attempted murder. And the most horrifying CGI that I've ever seen. Oscar's face right there should get this movie rated R. Actually, it should be rated like NC Nobody. I wish I knew now what I knew then. I still don't think that Oscar has the capability to know anything. And after all of this, and after all the abuse and the ignorance, he still gets the girl. Look, I, I can understand why Oscar might be attracted to Angie. Sort of. But why the hell is Angie still attracted to Oscar? Maybe there's a reason at the beginning of the movie, but after everything he did, after betting gifts on horse races, after ignoring all the signs, after having her swallowed by a fucking shark, why does she like him now? Because he's no longer lying and now he's happy to work at a dead-end job for the rest of his life? Young love. Young, stupid, divorce in five years love. Oscar, I excuse me, Oscar. You've lost everything you lied so hard to achieve. Tell me, what's next for you? Ooh, the first lawsuit is coming from Coca- I, I mean, Coral Cola. That should be an interesting one. I hear their legal department is feisty. Seriously, don't be a lying asshole with one of the oldest morals out there. There are ancient mythological stories about liars getting their comeuppance. How do you screw up the most basic, cliched moral of all time? Is Shark Tale the worst movie ever? No, it has a few problems to just grate on you as the movie goes on. The biggest problem is that it's largely the shade and that Oscar is a moron. You've seen every part of this story before somewhere else. And you've seen the parodies and satires of them too, to the point that even they're beginning to be cliched. And this cliché plot is marred by stupid writing and stupid characters. This is why a lot of people don't like DreamWorks. Not this movie in particular, but all the stupid in-your-face tropes that this movie uses. Speaking of that, you know when Pixar made Toy Story, they had a problem with Woody. He was too much of an asshole in the earlier versions of the movie. So do you know what they did? They rewrote it and made new versions. I don't know why they didn't rewrite this one in a few times. It could have been decent. Sure, the animation wouldn't have really held up, but at least the story could have. Oh wait. I forgot. If they took time rewriting this movie, then Finding Nemo wouldn't be relevant anymore and there'd be no more reason to make this movie at all. Dorby's. Nuts take. Can a brother my complexion roll in your direction? I'm gonna have your baby, Jamal. Mm. Mm. We ain't always gonna be bench warmers. I got real potential. No, you don't. Ah. 